Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome. And a particular welcome to Helen Clarkson. And thank her for taking time from her crazy schedule <laughs> to fit us in here. Uh, it is marvellous. Before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. Please be sure your mobile phones are on silent. <clears throat> and the note in front of me says that I'm to encourage you to tweet using the handle at IIEA. And uh, the initial address, that is Helen's initial address, will be on the record, but the Q&A session afterwards will be strictly under the Chatham House rule. And if anyone is not sure what that is, raise your hand and I will read it to you. But I think we all know <coughs> basically that uh, participants are free to use information you receive, but you're not to identify uh, neither the affiliation of the speaker nor that of any other participant uh, subsequently in terms of the points made. We're here today to listen to Helen Clarkson to address us on mobilising governments and businesses to tackle climate change. I've asked Helen to uh, stick to the 20-25 minutes if she can because I think the Q&A session is uh, often extremely worthwhile and it gets frustrating if you have to cut people off when they're just going and we'd like to finish at two o'clock sharp according to this note here anyway I've been told to do that okay so we'll try and keep as close to that as is possible if we may. Um, Helen Clarkson is the chief executive officer of the climate group and this is a powerful network of businesses and governments whose mission and whole aim is to accelerate climate action generally. Um, she comes to us today just a week after the conclusion of the Climate Week in New York of which um, the, uh, the climate group were very active participants. In fact I think uh, there was a global event run jointly by the climate group the United Nations and New York um, and the city of New York and I'm sure Helen will tell us a bit about that in a moment. But um, her, organisa her organisation, the Climate Group, has two particularly important networks, RE100, which is a group of the world's most influential companies committed to 100% renewable power, and the Under2 Coalition, which brings together more than 220 state and regional governments, which represent 1.3 billion people and 43% of the global economy. Shamefully, Ireland is not part of the Under Two Coalition. More perhaps anon. <laughs> Helen herself was appointed Chief Executive of the Climate Group in March 2017, and prior to that she worked at the Forum for the Future, where she led work with large US corporations to solve complex sustainability challenges. She has also worked for Médecins Sans Frontières, where she worked on humanitarian missions in countries including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Burundi, Pakistan and Nigeria. And she holds degrees from both the University of Cambridge and Burbank College London. A fascinating backstory mm -hmm. and a fascinating position at the moment. Helen, thank you. the floor is yours. Mobilising governments and businesses to tackle climate change. Thank you. And I'll mobilise myself over here and I've got my watch because I've got the message about staying to time. So thank you. Thanks very much uh, for having me here today. Um, as has been said, I'm Chief Exec of the Climate Group. Um, and what I'll talk to you about is who we are, because I'm sure most of you haven't heard of us. Um, how we work with business and government and why we work with businesses and governments, who, we, who we're talking to, who I'm referring to when I say governments. It's a particular layer of government. Um, and how we use that to shift markets and policies. And I'll give you a specific example, which is called the ZEV challenge, zero emission vehicle challenge. And a bit of a look forward, but I think some of you are much more deeper into what's coming on the kind of policy horizon. Uh, but I can share you, I was going to say my hopes and optimism, but today is not a good day. We've had the 1.5 degree C report, special, special report from the IPCC, which I'm sure some of you are starting to kind of dig into um, and worry about. So our mission is, um, our vision is to accelerate climate action. Uh, we're very much focused on that action piece, and I'll talk about that. Um, here we talk about a world of under 2 degrees C of warming. Actually, we want to keep it well below that, close to 1.5. 
But you'll see later, we work with something called the Under 2 Coalition, and it was getting too confusing to have different numbers all over the place. So we've kept it like this. Um, and we do that by bringing together these networks and coalitions of businesses and governments which aim to move markets and move policies. And the idea there is to take, we're not an innovation house, we're not inventing things, but we're taking proven innovations and working out how you get those to scale. It's all about the acceleration. And we look for where the biggest global opportunities are for change. Now, as you, I don't normally share this next slide, and, and now I realise you can't read it anyway, but I used the wrong ratio in uh, PowerPoint, it looks like. So um, I thought, as you're a think tank, you might like theories of change. Not everyone does. Not even everyone in my own organisation does. But this is how we uh, aim to create change. And it's relevant to this conversation about why we're trying to mobilise. So we build these networks of businesses and governments with ambitious goals in the middle of them. So everyone who comes to us has to make an ambitious commitment. We talk about sort of hundreds and zeros. And the reason for that is what we found is if you make a business, if you've got a business to commit to 90% renewable electricity, That'd be pretty good. It's a lot better than most businesses are doing. And you could say, well, that's probably in line with the science. It's, it's fine. But what we found is that behaviorally, behaviorally, everyone within the business then assumes that they're in the 10% and nothing happens. So if you set a 100% goal, and what you have to do is persuade businesses that you don't know how to do that last 10%. We know that. We know you don't know how to get to 100 but set the ambition there, and you'll start to unleash innovation within the business, because everyone knows that, therefore, it applies to them. And when we do the reporting, what we're finding is that companies that set 100% targets get there quicker than they thought they could. So we build these networks of businesses and governments, create these network initiatives. That's the second bubble. So we bring them together. We do lots of peer learning, so we put them in touch with one another. We're trying to get more and more into how do we get those companies to work together? Can they do joint purchasing agreements? We're looking at things quite regionally, groups of companies in Europe, say, or Asia working together. And I think that's going to continue to grow. And we convert, as we said, their commitment into action. So the idea is make a commitment, and then we work with you to actually then deliver on it. And then we have two sort of, they're not quite carrot and stick, but, we, but more or less, so we use transparency so a lot of reporting, let's check how they're doing. We're going to check in with you, Annalie. We're going to see how you're doing. Keep, keep the momentum up that way. But we also really believe in communication. So we probably have a much bigger communications team and budget than most nonprofits because we want to continue to keep pressure but also reward and inspire others. So we're trying to create momentum through these coalitions. And what we're finding with RE100, which I'll talk a bit about, is that companies now self-refer. So in the early days of one of these initiatives, you have to go out and knock on all these doors, persuade people. But now with RE100, we're at 150 companies. We don't have to do much active recruitment because people out there see it and want to join it. And that's through using communications. And the idea then is you drive the ambition. So companies that are meeting their 100% goals, at the moment, a lot of them are using RECs to do that, so energy certificates. But then you try and push the ambition to be more about getting new energy onto the grid. So that's the idea. It's a kind of idea is that this circle creates the acceleration. So on the business side, I hate this diagram, but I'm sorry, I, did not, I do not have the design say of my organisation, I haven't yet persuaded them to change it, and we haven't come up with anything better. We have three things, put them in a triangle, seem to be the thought process, but anyway, we have at the moment three hundreds campaigns as we call them, EP100, RE100 and EV100. So EP100 is energy productivity. We thought that if we called it energy productivity, it was so much sexier than energy efficiency that people would flock to us and sign up in droves. But yet it remains, I think this is very strange and something we might get onto in the discussion. So sort of energy efficiency is weirdly, or energy productivity is a kind of weird sort of, people aren't really into it. And I don't understand why, because you can save loads and loads of money if you get this right. And I, we have some thoughts about why. But EP100 is an ambition to double your energy productivity. So we're looking at the amount of energy used versus your economic activity. RE100 is a commitment to 100% renewable electricity. And then EV100 is about accelerating the uptake of electric vehicles. And there, companies can make a commitment either about their own fleet, so it might be their leased fleet, it might be their own fleet, 
or they can make a commitment around charging infrastructure, because we know a lot of the problem with EVs is this kind of fear about where am I going to recharge. So IKEA, one of the first signatories to that, and I always say, you don't know where your next nearest EV charging point is, but you probably know where your nearest IKEA is. So as they put charging infrastructure in, you go along there, they've now launched vegan hot dogs, so you get your vegan hot dog, you charge your thing, you buy a flat pack furniture or whatever. Um, so that's, these three things work together, and we think if you put those together... We haven't yet. We are on the verge, we think, of getting one company to sign up to all three. A lot of companies belong to maybe two of these, but we're trying to push ownership of all of them. And what's surprising to me, and again for discussion maybe, is why you'd sign up to 100% renewable electricity without having committed to doubling your energy productivity, because then you need less electricity, right? But it's one of those things, I don't know if you run into this with your policy work, those of you who do it, hard to get people to do. But anyway, these are the business action networks. Now, if you look at the next slide, this is, I wish it was a bit bigger, but this is who's in RE100. It's 150 businesses, and you'll see they are big businesses. You know, these are real leaders. Um, if you add together the renewable energy, re renewable electricity, electricity demand of these companies, you would get the equivalent electricity demand of a country the size of Poland. You'd get about the 23rd biggest country in the world in terms of electricity demand. So the idea is you're creating this massive demand signal. You're saying to the uh, renewable energy market, here is the demand. As we were talking, um, we've just been doing a lot of work on EVs, and at the Global Climate Summit in California, we've been pushing, and I'll talk about that, the ZEV Challenge. Mayor Garcetti, from, um, the mayor of Los Angeles, said was talking about EVs, he said, if you build them, we will drive them. So it's this demand signal. It's the same idea with this. If you provide renewable electricity, we're here to buy it. But there's also work going on to create new sources of electricity coming together um, and also doing policy work. So what's been really interesting is that as RE100 has grown, policymakers can see this, and this was the idea. We talk about moving markets, moving policy. You've put together this huge demand signal, but also a signal to policymakers that we need a policy environment in which these companies can get on. And so now that RE100 has grown to this side, we're finding that policymakers are listening and are interested in what RE100 companies have to do. So last year, or earlier this year, the European Clean Energy Package was coming together, and we could bring a group of RE100 companies to the policymakers in Brussels and talk about what they needed to stop there being barriers to them having PPAs. So it's getting into a conversation between businesses and policymakers so that the policy isn't about necessarily always creating the framework, but actually kind of locking down the system, the conditions in which things can work. So you get these companies saying, this is what we want, and you can take and work with the policymakers to figure that out. Um, I was looking up before I came what's happening here and what, which Irish companies we need to see in here. So by 2030, one third of Irish electricity demand will be from data centers. So you need to point me in the direction of those companies because we need to be talking about uh, those companies and getting them in here and getting them into EP100. So I'll take any referrals you have. Um, moving on to government. So we um, work as the secretariat of something called the Under Two Coalition. Now, I'll give you a bit of history, because I'll explain why it's called Under Two. Um, in the run-up to Paris, so 2015, Governor Jerry Brown in California, those of you who know him, he's, quite, he's a climate activist. He's also kind of an irascible old guy, basically. He's sort of 80-something now, quite, quite deaf and shouty. I've met him lots of times. I don't, I don't think he'd mind being described like that, but he's very, very angry. He's been working on this stuff for a long time, and he thinks no one's going quickly enough. He thinks California, which he's the governor of, of, isn't going quickly enough, and it's doing better than everywhere else. So he's very, very motivated and fired up. So three years ago in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, he was very worried, along with some others, that we weren't actually going to get an agreement. It's easy to look back in history and go, of course we were always going to get the Paris Agreement. But it wasn't clear that we would. And so what he did with his counterpart in the less famous than California, Baden-Württemberg in Germany, they came together and said, let's found a coalition of states and regions that are more ambitious than the national governments. Because what if we don't get a Paris Agreement? Maybe we can create a coalition that's big enough to move even without the Paris Agreement, it, you know, even if there is nothing in Paris. So they formed this thing called the Under Two. Now, it's a bit techy. It's actually under two tons of carbon. We've kept it more in the branding around under two degrees. Of course, then Paris happened and was more ambitious than that. So it's 
Paris, for those of you who don't think about it every day, which I do, um, is the ambition in Paris is well under two degrees with an with a ambitious target of 1.5, which this morning we've heard is technically possible. Um, so depends how optimistic you're feeling about that. But anyway, this group of governments is... So the map looks very blank. This is because I insisted on using a proper, as I call it, map of the world, rather than that one that kind of explodes Europe up to be massive. Um, we actually have 220 governments that are signed up. Most of them are state, regional, provincial. So now I wish I'd learned to read up about Irish Christmas cakes. This works in the UK, but I call it the marzipan layer. So, you know, you have this layer that comes under the icing, which is the national government, and you've got the cake. And there's this interesting level of government that sits between the two and is often kind of... People are often more connected with their state and region, even if they don't always know who those politicians are. It varies very widely from country to country about what powers they have. So, it can, so there are some places here which will almost never sign up because it just doesn't really exist as a level of government that's helpful there. But across Europe, across the US... Um, increasingly South America, we're getting very good coverage, and other parts of the world, this coalition is forming. And I've got some stats here, which looks a bit better than the map. Um, so actually, if you add it up, you get to an enormous um, coverage of the global economy um, and 1.3 billion people. And it's probably that, those numbers, because you know that 1.3 isn't like 43%, partly because we've got a lot of European states that are wealthy, that are signed up and are ambitious. So what do we do with them? Oh, sorry, one more thing about that, which we're quite excited by. There was a report going into the summit in California that data-driven Yale did, and they looked at all these types of coalitions that exist across the world, so networks, so C40, RE100, and they found that under two has the greatest potential for emissions reductions of all these sorts of networks. And if all the governments, and it's a big, big if, I acknowledge, if all the governments in that hit their targets, then by 2030 they would be reducing um, by 4.9 to 5.2 gigatons of carbon per annum by 2030, which is the equivalent of the EU. So that's how you can kind of imagine the emissions reductions potential. But that's the potential. So we have to figure out how to deliver on that. So what we do at the moment, we've got sort of five kind of lines of work. One is just, we call it engagement. That means just getting them to show up and remember they're part of it and keep reminding them of their targets and, and sort of keeping engaged with the whole thing. Then the actual work streams are setting out 2050 pathways. So we need each of these governments to say, how are they going to get to 2050? Now, if you go to McKinsey and ask them for a 2050 pathway, they'll charge you half a million dollars and probably take two or three years. So if you scale that up by 220 you realize it's not really going to work like that. So some of the work we're doing there is trying to create groups of economies that look quite similar and do a kind of good enough pathway for a forest economy, for a retail, for a manufacturing. So that's one way by bringing a coalition together you can do, start to do some sort of leapfrogging. Um, we also do MRV work, measurement, reporting, verification. So as I said before, always checking in on how they're doing, but we're also have a project to help skill up some of the countries to do their MRV. So not just always um, believing what we get, but also doing some work around capacity building there. And then the third work stream uh, is called policy, and that's around how do you get places to learn from one another, and can we get some acceleration going by not every region in the world sort of sitting down with a blank piece of paper and thinking, right, what are we, uh, how are we going to do this now? So we've had something running over the last year, called the, the last three years, called the Energy Transition Platform. That's just wound up, and there'll be a new version called the Industrial Transition Platform. But essentially what that's done is to take 11 economies that look pretty similar, so Alberta, Minnesota, Wales, North Rhine-Westphalia, these places which you can hear are in very different parts of the world, but they all have a very similar problem, which they have concentrated heavy industry. So you've got maybe... The person from Wales said, we've basically got 12 companies here. It's kind of tiny, so you've got concentration of jobs and a concentration of emissions. And these are big global multinationals. They don't really care which country they're based in. If you go too hardly, they just lift their jobs up, dump them in another country, and you've got a political problem on your hand. And you might have tackled your emissions reductions, but you haven't really done that in a way which, if you go back to our mission, is about ensuring greater prosperity for all. So what can Wales, as they're looking at that, learn from Alberta, which is looking at a, a quite similar problem? Can we nick policies from one another, copy... And what we're finding is you can't just copy-paste 
a policy from one place to another, but a lot of the processes that you go through are quite similar. So our next version of this project is going to look much more about what are the processes to be a politician or change maker or civil servant in these places. And I went to one of the meetings of this group, and it was like people were meeting their long-lost cousins because, you know, you've got one civil servant in Wales thinking about this all the time, and they found their counterpart who sits in Minnesota thinking about this all the time, and, and it was lovely. So we're going to keep building that out and start to do it with other clusters we can see. If you're interested in such things, which I hope you are, um, we have a policy action map which we're also developing because what we want is our members to be able to see who's got a policy on what where and this will just hopefully continue to grow and grow. Um, and we also, on this point about um, states and regions have very different powers, we were finding it really hard to get our heads around what can states and regions do because it's so different. So Rocky Mountain Institute, who are, are cleverer than us, they're very good at this sort of thing, uh, were given some money to go and figure that out. And we've now got this, which is great. It's called the Carbon Free Regions Handbook. And it's got lots of ideas about the types of policy. It's got case studies and so on. Um, we're going to use this to um, direct our policy work. Um, but it's a really good, oh, sorry, rec recommended reading. It's a page turner. It's, it's good. It's very good. It's got some good case studies in there. The final thing we do as cli climate group, as I said, we do a lot about communications. And one of the things that we do every year is run something called Climate Week in New York, which some of you might have been at. It runs alongside the UN General Assembly. So the idea is that you've got a lot of stuff going on about climate when you've got all the heads of state in town. And we actually got some of them there last week. I failed to include, because I'm just not very good at PowerPoint, um, but Jacinda Ardern, who I'm just a fan of, uh, spoke at our opening ceremony for that. So I've got a nice cheesy picture <laughs> with her. We had a little name badge for the baby, but the baby didn't had jet lag, so it didn't come, which is a shame. But uh, we also had the head of state of Peru, who has a very large entourage, uh, Haiti, various other places. So it was great to have them there and coming and just getting people, to, getting them to think about climate change. And the fact that it was so far up their agenda was great. Hopefully, in future, we get kind of other bigger maybe, one might say, even heads of state. It's been going on for 10 years. This was just the um, theme this year. We were trying to really get the people of New York to notice it a bit more um, as a leading city. But we can talk more about that in the discussion. And then I just wanted to give you an example of um, all of this coming together. So um, as you know, we had, uh, well, some of you will know, that in the beginning of September, there was this Global Climate Action Summit. Again, Governor Brown. Uh, flexing his muscles, pulling everyone together in California. Um, and I was on the advisory council for that, um, which was quite, it was quite hard work, um, because what they wanted to do was to make sure that everyone who came to that had new commitments. So it was a kind of year run-in. It's not just show up and tell us what you've been doing. More commitments, really trying to drive that. So we pulled something called uh, together called the Zero Emission Vehicle Challenge. I do have a photo of myself looking incredibly sweaty. They made me launch it. That's a Formula E vehicle, which is the more interesting thing in this picture. So Formula E, uh, the racing, uh, it's like Formula One, but it's electric, Formula E. Um, with a lot of these innovations, they start off in, that, in those kind of elite car bit, and then they kind of trickle down. Um, so they brought that along. Um, and what you just cut off, because, I don't know, it's such a bad picture, but anyway, Mary Nichols is just cut off the edge of the side there. Now, she is in charge of the California Air Resources Board. Um, and if you follow these things at all, California are locked into a battle with the federal US government moment about emission standards. And California has been very leading and has always pushed the emission standards for the states because they've had this ability to set their own standards, which means that um, car manufacturers essentially have to manufacture to the California standards. And they're, they're locked in this battle at the moment. So it's great to get Mary there, because she's just day to day with the manufacturers talking about this stuff. But the idea of the challenge was to take our EV100 campaign, add it together with C40 Cities, which is a network of 95 of the biggest cities. They have something called Green and Healthy Streets, which is a commitment to electric public transport, particularly buses. Add that together, and then we went out to the under two governments and said, why don't you make the same commitment as EV100? So using their purchasing power to procure electric vehicles. And when you add all of that together, you start to get a really big demand signal to the electric uh, vehicle manufacturers, and more importantly, to the um, internal combustion engine manufacturers. So we were 
And we had to word this very carefully with California because where they are in their particular battle. But we talked a lot over these days about how do we start to get a signal from the automotive companies about what their end game is for the combustion engine. And we need to hear that because if you look at something like the IPCC report that came out today, that day we've got countries around the world committed to 2040, but we need to be bringing that closer and closer. And I think if you can add together the demand and sh send this demand signal, again, you give certainty into the market for the automotive companies to feel like they can phase out. So we're early stages, but in the first year of having, since we launched EV100 and bringing these together, we now have over 60 cities, states, and businesses. And when you start to add their targets together, you really get to quite a large um, market. So we're going to continue um, to grow that, and we're going to continue to figure out how to put pressure on the automotive companies. And we want at least one of them to come forward and tell us when are you going to stop um, producing the combustion engine. Right, we will move off the picture of me looking great. It was so hot in there. It was a warehouse in Brooklyn, and they shut all the doors, and then we just baked inside. I think maybe the idea was to put pressure on the automotive companies, like we won't let you out until... Uh, but anyway, they weren't there. So... This is my last thing. I was trying to think about looking forward and where all this is going. Obviously, we're going to continue to be building these. We'll start looking soon at what comes next in terms of the hundreds, but just in terms of what all this is doing. So where we are in the kind of climate policy cycle, as it were, and I know there's bigger experts than me here for sure on a lot of these things. So the IPCC special report came out today. Um, in a few weeks, the lucky ones amongst us here will assemble in Katowice in Poland. I'm not looking forward to that at all, because it's going to be very cold and hard to get to. Um, but that's the next COP, Conference of the Parties. It's when the um, parties to the UN, FCCC, come together again. Um, and the idea then is that we're all moving towards 2020. Essentially, that's the next big year when the nationally determined contributions, which form the basis of the Paris Agreement, when they're next looked at. And so these two COPs this year and next year in Brazil, the idea is to be sort of putting the pressure on the governments, agreeing the rule books and so on. Um, if you add together the current NDCs, it would take us to three degrees of warming. And we're already hearing today in the report about how disastrous two degrees is going. So we just don't have an option. We've got to get these um, NDCs down. I also put US exit from Paris, possibly in 2020. Probably, but... I'm holding my optimistic heart is set on uh, a democratic president who wins and the next day says it's fine, we're staying in Paris. Because the timing, they've got four days between their victory party and saying that they're going to stay. So we can hope for that. But, you know, look where the cop is next year, Brazil. And um, obviously a big election going on there and quite terrifying election going on that right now. So from a climate point of view, the big questions are we need to keep the pressure on but also support national governments. And a lot of the work we do um, and the idea of the California conference is this kind of showing what's happening in the, the real economy, as it were. So businesses, investors, sub-national governments, um, showing that all of those players are moving and doing enough to support the governments to be more ambitious. And that's why the kind of theme of the California conference was step up so everyone needs to take a step up everyone needs to do more we are seeing a lot of movement we're seeing a lot of really ambitious leadership but there's just tons and tons um to do i'm going to leave it there that was 25 minutes there you go